you said a number of really interesting things. Uh, one of which is that you were you're, you are a writer, and uh, now you're also a podcaster. How has the hunting industry and the outdoor industry as a whole changed in terms of making a profession in it? Can you make a profession as a writer in print journalism nowadays? And uh, w what is the future for that? And can you make a prof can you make a living podcasting? That's a challenging one to answer because when I got into the writing world. Oh, I wrote freelance part-time for about five years, and then 15 years ago, I uh, got into it full-time, and I've been making a full-time living at writing since, but a friend and I, an editor friend and I, were trying to count up the full-time gun writers, as we call them, in this realm, you know, that I write in a few months ago, and I think there's less than 40 in the United States mm -hmm. that are making a full-time living at it, and it's getting harder because digital media is becoming more and more predominant and print media is slowly dying off and you get fewer and fewer readers that want to read a 3,000 word article and more and more that just want that two minute quick catchy read, right? Like they get on the, the internet. So I think you can still, if you really want to and you work really hard and you're really stubborn and really lucky, mm -hmm. you can still get into the industry and uh, make some money writing. But I wouldn't recommend making that your life's plan because I was lucky. I was very, very fortunate to get into this. The main reason I, tra you know, I started transitioning into or adding podcasting into my life was because I could see that it's um, a, a large player in the future of the way that information is consumed right mm -hmm. and something I really loved about it is that it's a combination of the things we love about retro media transfer meaning radio mm -hmm. and modern because it's basically a radio show that you get to pick the topic mm -hmm. the host and when you listen to it yeah. and you can do it when you're driving when you're mowing the lawn when you're sitting on a ridge glassing for elk or deer whatever the case is so uh, I really liked the way that podcasts transfer, transfer information and um, just conceptualized the Backcountry Hunting Podcast and gave it a try. And thankfully, it, it's um, done well. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You see, yeah, as the print journalism is moving toward shorter and shorter form, uh, you see this in the news as well. You know, people mm -hmm. are getting their news from these long form media shows as opposed to short 24 hour news segments. Uh, it, I think it's, it says something positive to me about, you know, we see all sorts of cynical statements about attention spans in this technological day and age, but people are t tuning in to two, three hour podcasts regularly. Right? Sure. You know, uh, it's uh, maybe hopeful for long form journalism, but it is weird that that's, it's sort of the, the rise of the long form podcast is coinciding with the downfall of, downfall of long form journalism. And that's interesting. I didn't know that uh, journalism is getting shorter and shorter. Yeah, and I think the average age of uh, you know magazine subscriber now is between fifty and sixty. Mm -hmm. You know, a few young people still subscribe. I subscribed to my first shooting magazine, Shooting Times, which I now write for full time. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was eleven, I stole a little subscription card from the mm -hmm. dentist's office mm -hmm. and had my mom subscribe, and then. Uh, one thing led to another, and I was actually the editor-in-chief of that magazine for four years, mm -hmm. and I, I learned a lot, and it basically gave me the, the springboard from which to leap into writing full-time, mm -hmm. which I've been doing now for 10 years. Is the practice of preparing for a podcast different from that of writing a, a journalistic piece? Yes and no. There are a lot of similar elements. Um, creating a good outline up front is helpful for both, right? When I prepare for a podcast subject, I'll try and create a list of bullet points. For an article, I'll generally do a, uh, I call them subheads, you know, I'll go in and create a, an initial document and then that helps keep me on track and guide me through it, right? Mm -hmm. With a firearm review, let's say, a technical review, there's a lot of additional elements. Uh, there's test shooting, mm -hmm. right, which you gotta, ring out a firearm pretty thoroughly if you're going to give a authoritative review. And then photography. I've spent a lot of time becoming a, 
a moderately good amateur photographer because mm. I could see that was part of, I mean, it's job security as a mm. writer. A lot of the old time mm. writers, they'd take a picture laying on a sidewalk and send it in and, and the editors would just, you know, it was black and white and they'd mm -hmm. plug it in because it wasn't as big a deal back yep. then. Yep. But interestingly with, with phones now and, and the crisp clean look that Apple and other companies have brought to people, everybody expects better imagery. And so yeah. if you don't provide that, you, you start making yourself obsolete pretty mm -hmm. quickly. And even with your podcast, you're sort of expected to build a multimedia approach in, in that you've got your Instagram and mm -hmm. you know, verse, which I think is really cool because it's, uh, it's very exciting to have all of these different, although maybe it's overwhelming to produce, it's if for the consumer, it's cool to have this, uh, you know, multi-dimensional uh, product. It, we're, we're not just seeing, we're not just hearing you over the radio and ha it's a, you know, a voice in the ether, but seeing these pictures of, oh, this is what Joseph's been hunting and here's this kid with this bigger buck than I've ever killed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's, are there things that are lost? So what is lost in a podcast versus a, uh, a journalistic essay? Mm. Visual aids would mm -hmm. be the first one. Uh, charts that you can sit and stare at and compare, mm. you know, the velocity and the group size of this load versus that in a certain type of rifle or ammunition review, or even just seeing the scenery in a like a you know backcountry drop camp DIY moose hunt in Alaska. In an article, you get visual aids and charts that you can sit and and just percolate in until you absorb the information mm -hmm. adequately. With the podcast, it's all audio, right? Yep. Unless you're streaming it out over YouTube or something as well. And so it's hard to use um, any kind of visual aid. Generally, you have to try and create a, a mental picture with mm. your description. And uh, I find that actually a challenge that I enjoy. On the flip side, a podcast gives a little more time I don't want to uh, use the term incorrectly, but you more or less have a captive audience, right? Mm. Once somebody's sitting in their semi-truck or on the ridge glassing or <laughs> driving their lawnmower, they're kind of just going along doing their job while they listen. And if you want to dig in for five minutes onto why ballistic coefficient is so important for long range shooting, you can do that. Where in an article, if you were to go on for three or four paragraphs on that, you'd lose your reader, right? Yeah, it's conducive to digesting a different type of information. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, on, a, on a podcast, I'd never be able to digest, you know, numbers and statistics that's, and graphs. That's a good point. Uh, and uh, whereas, but you can get deeper. That, that's, that's cool. And has, has, has making a podcast been successful and it's, it's part of your professional work now? Yeah, it's, it's getting there. We continue to work to try and grow it. And the, the biggest challenge, honestly, is that when I started the podcast, I was writing full time. So often 50, 55, sometimes 60 hours a week, plus mm -hmm. family of four kids. And my wife works, she works from home, but she's an artist, right? She spends a certain number of hours every day in her studio. Mm -hmm. And now we've got kids in sports. And of course, all four of them, I sometimes think I've shot myself in the foot. All four of them are passionate about hunting. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I've got one out of the four that kind of likes to go with me. Anytime there's an opportunity, they all want to go. And so I'm busy there, but the podcast then has created additional demands on my time. And I've, I generally figure about 12 to 20 hours to create an episode because really? I do all my own editing mm -hmm. and uh, publishing and of course, creating an outline and so forth. And so I've had to plug that workload in with everything else. Yeah. And it's been really fulfilling, especially, interestingly enough, something I didn't expect, the community that's built. Because I, I try, this is another area I may have shot myself in the foot, but I try and answer questions, mm -hmm. whether they come in on Instagram or email or whatnot, I try and answer all the questions I get. and. I've made some good friends that way and a lot of acquaintances that I stay in touch with and kind of follow their hunting adventures. But the podcast has begun to monetize and I hope that with continued dedication to it, that it'll continue to grow to a point where it's a significant part of my 
living. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You, it is, there's something about hearing you on the podcast which does seem more accessible. I guess probably when you were solely a print journalist, people would reach out in writing, but it's a little bit more formal. It's like one step removed. And so it's, people are quite negative about the internet and social media, but especially moving to a rural place, I've met a number, a number of like-minded people who have, I've developed friendships with mm -hmm. through social media. So I think it can be a positive tool when used in the right way. And, as the old forms of communities sort of erode, we need to replace them with something. So hopefully it will be, that would be a component, but not the whole deal. Yeah. You know, part of the reason I've, I've tried to approach uh, the, the interaction with listeners the way I have is years ago, geez, probably 20 years ago, I was at a trade show uh, with a friend and he ran into a celebrity that he'd been following on TV for 10 years. I mean, he'd watched everything this guy had ever produced and felt like he knew him quite well because uh, of, of all the time he'd spent watching. The guy's very approachable on TV mm -hmm. and a very, very good proponent of the outdoors and so forth. One of my all-time favorite communicators. I'm not going to give a name, but mm -hmm. he ran into him at the trade show and the guy's sitting in his booth and he went up and just said, started trying to try, strike up a conversation. And I think this celebrity was just exhausted. You know, you probably get to a point when you, you achieve a certain notoriety where the onslaught of people wanting to talk to you becomes exhausting. Mm -hmm. And he really blew off my friend. Mm -hmm. And my friend came away thinking, I'm feeling almost like betrayed, right, by a good yeah. friend. And I thought, you know what, I never want to do that to anybody. Yeah. And there are times when I get a really, I hesitate to use the word, but asinine question, you know. <laughs> I take a deep breath and I try and answer it, you know, understanding that maybe that person wasn't trying to come across that way. He just really didn't have a fundamental understanding. Uh, other times I get somebody that sends me a question two or three times a day. Mm -hmm. And I'll try and just let them accumulate and then answer a few in a row, you know. <laughs> but in, in all things considered, I've had such good interaction with, with listeners. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, uh, it's a, a bit like the playground. Like mo most people get, get the social cues, but, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, oh, but yeah. you know, thankfully you're an adult so you can deal with it gently.